This is flip mini lecture number 41. And it's the only one I'm going to do on night chapter 14. And we're just going to cover the easy stuff in night chapter 14, which is in section 14.1 to 14.4. What was in the rest of chapter 14? Well, that stuff's about moving liquids. This stuff is just about liquids that are still, okay? Or nearly still. So the first thing to know about a liquid, or actually even a gas, or actually even a solid, is that it has a density. And it's usually this letter that looks a little like a P, but isn't. It's kind of a script P. That's a rho. So we usually use rho for density. Now, if you take a little volume of the liquid, some small volumes, okay? So you've got maybe a little box here that you can kind of imagine as being sitting inside this liquid. The box is completely imaginary, but it has a certain size. It has a little delta x. It has a little delta y. And it has a little delta z. So that's its width, its height, and its depth going into or coming out of the board at you. And of course, that means it has a little volume, delta v, which is equal to delta x, delta y, delta z. And this use of delta, by the way, just means a little. I'm not really subtracting a final minus an initial. I just mean a little volume, delta v. It's got these little sides, delta x, delta y, and delta z. Now, this little volume contains some fluid. And this fluid has a little mass in it, which I'll call delta m. Now, you can take delta M and divide it by delta V. Now that's kind of an interesting quantity because if I made this little cube half as big, like let's suppose I divided delta X divided by two. So now I've only got half the cube, this part here. Well then clearly I'd have half as much mass. So if I take the ratio, which is the product of the three sides, and call that delta V and put that in the denominator, and I take the mass and put that in the numerator, if I half the volume, I have the mass. So this ratio is independent of the amount of volume I take. So that's, it's worth something then. You, we've identified some property of the liquid that's independent of the size of this little volume. It's this ratio which is delta M over delta V. Now what's all this stuff about a little, a little, a little, a little? Well, because maybe if this is down here deeper in the liquid, maybe down here, if this is a compressible liquid, maybe down here it's denser. Or if this was air, and this was the surface of the earth down here, and maybe this was uh, a thousand feet up here and now up here we're at 10,000 feet. Well, the air's thinner at 10,000 feet. So if I measure the mass of a little volume at 10,000 feet and divide it by that volume, I'm going to get a number that's less than if I measure the mass at 1,000 feet and divide by that little volume. So it's important that when you do this division, if the fluids, uh, Density, this is called the density. If it's changing from place to place, you better use a small mass and a small volume over which it doesn't change much. Otherwise, you're not going to get a sensible value for the density. Okay, so now you know what density is. And of course, you can turn it around. If somebody tells you the density and then they say, oh, and by the way, I've got this much liquid. Like if they say, I have... Uh, three milliliters, which is an, a, a size, a liter is a size, a milliliter is a thousandth of a liter, so three milliliters is three thousandths of a liter. If they say, I have three milliliters of something that weighs um, 700 grams per liter, then you can say, oh, I've got three milliliters of stuff 
I've got a density of 700 grams per liter, then I can turn this equation around to say that delta M equals rho delta V. I put in the three milliliters. I put in the 700 grams per liter, and that gives me 2100 but then I've got milliliters in the numerator and liters in the denominator, so that gives me, I, that actually only gives me 2.1 once I convert milliliters to liters. 2.1 grams of stuff. Okay? Now, the next most important thing to know about a liquid, or a gas actually, um, is that it has a pressure. And so I need to define what a pressure is. So suppose you have, let's say, a big, beautiful swimming pool, okay? And over here on the side of the swimming pool, you have a little observation window, okay? And here you are standing beside the swimming pool, and you've got this nice little observation window. And maybe with this observation window, you can watch people doing freestyle and film their technique. Okay, so let's just assume this window is small. That is, let's assume that this window is sufficiently small that this height up here is not that much uh, higher than this height down here at the bottom of the window. So imagine this is a little porthole down deep in the pool, okay? Now, this little porthole, of course, has some area. Let's give it a little width. We'll call that W, and let's give it a little height. We'll call that H. This little thing has some area. A is equal to WH. Now, it makes sense that this pool is pressing on this window. And because it's pressing on this window, there's some force on this window, okay? So, like, if you looked at the free body diagram for this window, there'd be force of pool, on window. And thankfully, unless you're going to get wet back here, there's going to be some force of the corners of the frame holding the window in, okay? So something is going to be keeping this window from shooting out at you. But there's the force of the pool, that's actually the pool water, on the window. And meanwhile, there's the frame that's, that's keeping this thing in position. So the force of the pool water on the window it makes, I hope, intuitive sense that if this window was was twice as wide, say, that is, if this window this window is twice as big, if this window was twice as wide, then there you'd have twice as much force. If this window was three times as wide, you'd have three times as much force on the window. So you can see that the force of the pool water on the window is proportional to the area of the window. So once again, we can take the force of the pool water on the window and divide it by the area, and we're going to come up with something that is independent of the area. So like if I doubled the area, I'd have double the force. So this ratio, F over A, is independent of the area. Unless the area gets real big, in which case, like if the area gets real tall, then we got a problem again, because the top parts near the surface are not going to have as much force per unit area as the bottom parts near the bottom. So once again, just like in the case of density, you have to keep the size small, okay? Maybe even to emphasize that, I should say, we have a little bit of force over a little bit of area. Just to emphasize, you, this is just not going to work if you take large areas over which the, over which, uh, the area is... The, the, the force of the pool water is changing much. So, okay, if you've got delta F over delta A and you've convinced yourself that, that, that this ratio is independent of the area, then we need to give it a name, and the name is pressure. So the little bit of force that you get against this little window, if you take that little bit of force, you divide by that little bit of area, and you get pressure. Another way of saying that is that pressure is... Force per unit area.
Now, just like with, with density, once you've defined this, you can go the other way. If somebody says, hey, I know the pressure, and you say, oh, well, I know the area. It's, uh, you know, two centimeters by four centimeters. And then the pressure is going to be measured in something. Um, a common unit for pressure might be pounds per square inch. Pounds per square inch. And if you said here, instead of, if we were in a metric system all of a sudden, uh, if you said this, I got two inches by four inches is the size of my window. That's a really nice little tiny window. That's just barely a little porthole. Two inches by four inches, and then maybe this thing's got 50 pounds per square inch in it. Well, two inches by four inches is eight square inches. 50 pounds per square inch times eight square inches. F is equal to P times A. I'm putting 50 PSI into there, and I'm putting eight square inches into there. By the way, this is pounds per inch squared. 50 PSI into there, looks like I got 400 pounds of force. Okay. All right, so now you know what pressure is. Wow, am I going fast. I really recommend that you measure, you read along at night. In fact, at this point, it might be a great time that even though I've described all the essential formulas, it might be a good idea to take it slower and go back and look at 14.1, where Knight defined density, and then look at 14.2, where Knight defined pressure, and make sure you understand some of his examples and his diagrams. I'm gonna skip right over 14.3, which is pressure gauges and stuff like that, and blood pressure, and I'm gonna to go to 14.4, which is buoyancy.